So the limbic system is um, lots of different parts within the hemispheres, both left and right, pretty centralized, but they're all interconnected. It's gonna be things like the mammillary bodies, the um, different nuclei, cingulate gyrus from the frontal lobe, uh, parahippocampal gyrus from the temporal lobe. It's all different parts of these lobes in the middle, but they're all connected and they all compromise or make up the emotional brain. Um, that's what we call the limbic system. Why? Because that's the part that's going to play a huge role in our emotions, our pain and pleasure, um, affection, anger, aggression. All of those emotions are tied together with this limbic system. So it's just different nuclei, um, different parts of different lobes, but they're all tied together into one system, and that is the limbic system. Okay, so what you need to know is you need to be able to recognize that the limbic system is your emotional brain. It's the part that um, controls or deals with your emotions, your pain, your sadness, your happiness, your um, pleasure. Okay? Any questions on that? No? So if someone were to have um, some sort of lesion in that limbic system, that's where you'll see someone who maybe um, doesn't show any emotion or doesn't feel pain, or maybe uh, feels pain all the time, or maybe is um, ecstatic all the time, super happy, or super sad. There'll be some type of imbalance with emotion. So that is your limbic system. The reticular formation, this is the one that applies to all of you, okay? <laughs> so the reticular formation um, actually extends from that top part of the spinal cord here all the way up into that hypothalamus. And it projects impulses throughout the cerebral cortex and the cerebellum. The purpose of the reticular formation is to keep us conscious and awake or wake us up from sleeping. That is our reticular formation. There is a part of that reticular formation called the reticular activating system. It is part of the reticular formation and its job is to wake you up or wake the entire cerebrum, cerebellum up every time there is some sort of sensory input. So that is the part where um, you're sleeping and somebody puts your hand in a cold cup of water, you wake up instantly. Or you're asleep and um, you hear a door open, or you hear a knock on the door, or something alerts you. Any type of sensory um, impulse coming in will wake you up, and that's done through that reticular activating system. What it does is it says, okay, hey, cortex, wake up, cerebellum, wake up. There's, there's sensory impulses coming in, something's going on, everybody wake up. So it wakes your entire brain up, all right? So this is the part that everybody in here struggles with when you're sitting in anatomy lecture and it's so boring and you want to fall asleep and you start dozing off. That means your reticular formation and the reticular activating system are kind of just shutting down. And that's when you go get a big cup of coffee to pump it up with caffeine and wake up your reticular formation to keep yourself awake. Okay, questions on the reticular formation. Again, you need to know uh, not necessarily everything that's part of it, because there's a lot of different parts that are part of it. Um, just understand that it's found over here, and this is what it does. It maintains consciousness or wakes us up from sleep. That reticular activating system is part of the reticular formation, so you could almost use them um, in place of each other. Some people don't even call it a reticular formation. They just call it the reticular activating system, and that's fine. The idea is that anytime there's sensory input coming in, that activating system will kick in if you're not already um, awake with that reticular formation. Make sense? Okay. So this is why we're so far ahead, because everyone just listens and doesn't ask anything. Okay. Yes, there you go. So, no, and the, the cool thing is our brain,
our bodies in general really get used to whatever we do, right? Because this, this ties into, um, very good question, by the way, ties into the, um, the discussion we had in yesterday's lecture when we did this, and someone asked, well, you know, why is it that I can sleep with my phone on and I can get 20 text messages overnight and it doesn't wake me up? Because you got used to it. So if you're used to falling asleep with the sound of the TV, that's not, not going to affect this because your reticular formation at that point is like, oh, yeah, that's just the usual. That's what we fall asleep to. Just like if you're used to having your phone on and you get, you know, ding, ding, ding in the middle of the night, it may wake you up the first couple of times, but after that, this part of your brain says, okay, this is normal. This is not something that we need to pay attention to right now. We're going to ignore it. Right? Whereas if something different, a different stimulus came in, like you know, someone broke your door down or a window breaks or a child screams, that might be a different um, sensory impulse that you're not used to getting during the night, and that will, that will activate this. So yeah, we have the ability to accommodate, um, fairly wide ability to accommodate, which is why you know, I tell people like when they first have their first baby and the baby takes a nap and everybody has to shut up in the house, and then I'll walk in and turn everything on and be like, nope, can't do that. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to do that. You don't want to get them used to sleeping in total silence because then they will only be able to sleep in total silence. So, um, huh? Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's what you get your body used to. But it, you can slowly, over time, you know, train yourself to sleep in light or train, train your brain to, to ignore those things, it does happen. So. so now if you sleep with the TV on, for you it'll be fine. But if you have somebody sleeping over and they're not used to it, it's going to make them crazy. There's no dumb questions. Yes. Yeah. So, and I think, I used to live in Alaska, actually. I think it's almost like a period of three months, does anybody know, where the sun just never goes down, <laughs> daylight. They have like three months of daylight and then three months of total darkness. And um, they actually have accommodations for that, if that makes sense. Like you will find, what? Yeah, major blackout curtain, right. Because again, just like we said, our circadian rhythms do depend on that light and dark to keep things in check. Um, and so, yeah, they will have to have some type of provision. Like in the, you know, in the daytime when it's still dark outside, they need to turn on all the lights, and they will be tired, and they won't be, used, they won't get used to it in that period of time. It's going to take at least a month for them to be okay with it. Um, but after that first 30 days or so, it'll be better. But yeah, it does mess it up completely. But that has to do with like circadian rhythms more than those. Um, but if that answer your question? Okay. So I'm going to be totally honest here. You asked the question, and I began to answer it. And I totally forgot what your question was by the time I was in the middle of answering it. There's some serious issues going on in this head. I'm telling you for real. Yeah, and I am medicated today, too. OK. <laughs> what? Yes. Right. So it does actually pertain to this because if you have narcolepsy, you're going to have something wrong with your um, or a lapse in your reticular formation, right? And that could be one of the reasons that you have nothing to keep you awake so you can fall asleep at any time. That could be one of the reasons. Anything else? No? Reticular activating system? Reticular formation? No? All right. This is super cool. Hemispheric lateralization. This is something that everybody kind of knows already, right? Like you've heard before. Or you already know that the entire left side of your body is controlled by the right side of your brain, the right hemisphere. The entire right side is controlled by the left hemisphere. Yes? And you may have heard somebody at some point in time say, well, I'm, um, I'm right-brained, or I'm right-sided. My brain's right-sided, my brain's left-sided. Anyone ever hear that? No, really? I must have been a nerd. Maybe I still am. OK, 
So let's talk about this. So yes, the left side of your body is controlled by the right hemisphere of the cerebrum and the right side of your body is controlled by the left hemisphere. But each hemisphere also has some characteristics that are um, unique to it, okay? And let's look at them. Let's talk about the right hemisphere first. And this is the one that I call my fun, um, my fun artistic hippie side. Art oh, I can't spell artistic. Art oh yeah, I did that. My fun artistic hippie side is my right side. Why is it my fun artistic hippie side? The right side, the right cerebral hemisphere is the side that is going to um, give you musical and artistic awareness. Face and pattern perception, and that helps artists too because you have to have, be able to tell the distance between things. Um, recognition of faces, emotional content of facial expressions. Emotional content of facial expressions. Um, it helps us generate emotional content with language, um, make mental images compared to special relationships, and identifying and discriminating among odors. So the right side of my brain is my fun hippie side, fun artistic hippie side. The left side is almost the opposite. This is my boring, this is my boring um, science or math professor side. Okay? So the left side, the left hemisphere is my boring, you can take your pick, science or math professor side. <laughs> Sorry, professors. Why? This is my analytical side. This is the side that um, will have reasoning. Very good at numbers and science, lots of numerical and scientific skill. Uh, ability to use and understand sign language, spoken and written language. That is my scholar side. Okay, so, ah, sorry. Is it true that one side can be more dominant than the other? Yes, it is true. Although the left side will always receive the sensory and the somatic um, motor control from the right side of the body and the right side will receive it from the left side of the body, there's other stuff more specific stuff that happens on each side. So if you are right, hemispheric dominant, we call that lateralization, um, you're going to be more artistic. You're going to be more, I'm not gonna say fun, but you'll be more of a colorful person. You'll have maybe musical abilities, you'll be a dancer. Um, you don't even have to be a good dancer, just like you can <laughs> Does this make sense? You'll have a lot more emotion when you talk. Um, if you're a left-sided person and your left hemisphere is more dominant, math, super easy for you. Science, super easy for you. Um, those are things that you are like totally just, it comes innately being able to do those things. You'll have, uh, be a very reasonable person. Um, and you may also have a very boring personality because you're just straightforward and um, it's all about the business right get in get it done and so that's my boring um, science or math professor side so right about now everyone's thinking okay which side am I you don't have to be either or okay I'm an example of I don't have a side why well um, so <coughs> Uh, musical, I play like maybe six different instruments. Artistic awareness, yep, I paint too. Um, I have no space and pattern perception at all, at all. I'm really bad at it. Um, <laughs> recognition of face, faces and emotional content. Of fa I think I have emotional content in my facial expressions. I don't recognize faces very well. Um, I might have emotional content in language, yeah, maybe. Okay, so I'm kind of there, but then you go to the left side. I'm also I'm a total science nerd. That's me. That's what I do. That's what I love. I can't do math. I can't even like calculate tip at a restaurant. It's really hard for me. So I see numbers. I get instant migraines. Yeah, 
I don't do math at all. Um, I don't understand sign language and I wish I could, but I probably never will. Um, I hate writing and I can barely speak. So, <laughs> so what, I, what, I mean, what I mean to say is when we talk about hemispheric lateralization, just because each hemisphere has things that are unique to it, does not mean that you have to be either or, okay? You could be using both hemispheres just as much and take something from each side. So you don't have to be a left brain or a right brain. Most people are a combination of both, okay? Um, so just add to that the understanding that the left hemisphere gets its uh, sensory and sense motor to the right. The right hemisphere gets sensory and sense motor to the left side of the body, okay? And then, um, over here, if we have damage on the left hemisphere, a lot of times we'll see them with aphasia. Aphasia is the inability to actually speak. If we have damage on the right side, and this one's written kind of confusing, I probably should have changed the wording here, but if you have damage in the right hemisphere, um, and we're talking about Broca's and Wernicke's here, right? You may end up with somebody that has a monotonous voice and can't put any emotion in their speech. They'll understand everything, they'll be able to talk, but everything will be super monotonic. I used to have a math teacher, an algebra teacher. I will never forget because I've never disliked the person this much in my life. But he would sit there and this was like eighth grade or ninth grade. I was in Mosley, so it's ninth grade. Um, and I don't do numbers anyway, so it's already a weak part, right? But he would talk like this the entire time, and it was so hard not to fall asleep. I couldn't get a thing from him. So I, if I had to do it over again, I would go back, and I'd be like, dude, go get your brain scanned, because you definitely have a lesion. Um, <laughs> you definitely have a lesion on the right hemisphere, somewhere where Broca <laughs> should be. Okay, um, any questions on? This stuff? No? Did we talk about Wernicke's and Broca's speech areas or no? We did. Is there any confusion on that? So Wernicke's is the sensory one, right? This one here is my sensory part. Broca's is my motor part, meaning this one is the one that the Wernicke's is what helps me take in those sound waves and understand what they're saying. They turn sound waves into thought. Uh, Broca's does the opposite. It turns our thoughts into movement that creates speech. Okay? And that's why if you damage the Broca's area on the right side, that's where you get that expressive speech. That's where the speech is actually happening. So a person who, with a right side damage in Broca's area can understand everything, can think about it logically, can respond logically, but it has no emotion in it. Because that's the right side is the one that imparts that emotion. Whereas Broca's on the left is just producing language. Same thing with what? Um, yeah, I mean, that's what, that, that's what we call this. So Wernicke's is what helps them hear it, process it, and understand it, speech or languages. And then Broca's is what takes your thoughts and puts it into movement with your mouth and lips and to create that sound. Does that make sense? Okay. So that means that the Broca's area on the right is going to be a little bit different than the one on the left. Okay. All right, brain waves, super cool. We've all heard of these, right? This is when they do that EEG. They put those uh, little probes all over your head um, and then measure your brain waves, your brain activity. So this is actually an electrical measurement of um, the activity or the synapses that are happening at any given moment in your nervous system. And we have um, classified them into different types of waves. And according to what you're doing is what waves, wave pattern you should be seeing. 
So the very first one we're going to look at is the alpha waves. Look over here at the alpha waves. They seem um, pretty average, not too high, not too low, spaced evenly. Alpha waves are your common brain wave. When do we see alpha waves? Whenever you are awake or even resting, but your eyes are closed. It's not asleep, awake. This is when you're sitting there, um, you know, sitting outside on the bench and you're bored. You're like, you can still hear everything. You're awake. You're just not really doing anything. That is our alpha waves. When you go to sleep, you should not see any alpha waves. Okay? They should not be present during sleep. Our beta waves, look at these. So they're a little bit more um, increased in frequency. They seem to happen a little more often. This is when you have active sensory input. I am sitting down studying. I'm working a math problem. I'm trying to remember what my grocery list was. All those um, would be reasons to see those beta waves. And that's in an adult. So you're now awake and also you have some sensory input coming in. Um, Either you're thinking about something or something is happening. You're sensing something. You're listening to the music. You're um, doing something mental, hopefully studying. Those are your beta waves. OK, theta waves. Let's look at these. They're sort of irregular, right? They're kind of spaced further apart from each other. Those theta waves are what we will see in children. Um, and adults that are stressed emotionally. So um, you're in an argument, you are upset, you're reading social media, and your mind is like, well, I can't believe that. Okay, that's when you're going to see those theta waves. So, do what? Because children's minds or their nervous system is still developing. So remember, from minute, you know, from birth, up until, shoot, even to your 20s, you're still, you're constantly developing your mind. And so at a young age, it's a rapid rate of development. We start with pretty immature nervous systems, and then we have to quickly um, absorb everything that happens in order to mature that nervous system. So children are still in that sort of, um, you know, the brain hasn't really fully developed yet. They're still developing things, so they haven't normalized with their waves yet. And then infants are even lower. So in infants, we're going to see um, delta waves. And that would be, this is a child that's, you know, under two years, just born a couple of months, six months old. Their brain waves are uh, spaced more apart, less frequent, and much larger. And those are, we call, those are what we call delta waves. And you will see those in infants normally and in deep sleep in adults. Sorry. What if what? Like, what if you went and you were awake and you, you did it and you ended up with some theta waves instead or delta waves while you were awake? That's when you would suspect there's a neurological disorder. Where would you see seizure activity? So you're going to, what you do is you're going to do it, right? You'll do this, they'll have the things hooked up, and then you're going to see like your waves. Oops, sorry. Tried to mess up your thing. <laughs> so what you're, what you're expecting to see is your alpha waves normally, right? So you'll see some alpha waves. If, you see, if they happen to have a seizure right then and there while they're hooked up to the machine, that's when you would see a difference. But normally you would see alpha waves, or you may see some theta waves if they're a little nervous. If they go into a seizure, you may see them go alternating between these theta and some of these beta. It's just going to kind of go, it's going to go like into hyper mode. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Instead of this, you're going to see something like this. Yeah. Because now it's like super speed. Make sense? So that would be your seizure, and then it would go back eventually to your normal. If there's no brain activity, no, yeah. Or almost flat. I mean, you may have a few little 
things, but not enough to to keep a person awake and vibrant. So, so. brain waves are cool. Yeah. Alkamani. Sorry, was uh, that a question? Yeah. Um, for the theta waves for the children. Do Wait, they hold on, hold on. I got to turn you up. Okay, now go. Okay, for theta waves, do children have to be like under emotional stress or does it matter? Do no, just... that's just normal in children. Oh, okay. I was confused oh, yeah. about that. No, no, that's normal. So um, theta waves for children is the normal and delta waves for infants is the normal. So if you had an infant in your office and you did this and instead of delta waves, you saw almost nothing or just really small delta waves, that's when I would worry about the child, right? Or if you had a, a child with, who you expect to see theta waves, but instead you're seeing more like delta waves, that's when you would start worrying. Something's not right. Make sense? So put it this way, the more active, the more active the brain is, the closer these, these mounds would be, right? Make sense? So the more activity, like look at the space between these here on these beta waves and look at the space here. Do you see how the spacing is much less? So the more peaks you get per, um, per second is a higher brain activity. The less you get, less brain activity. So that's how you know when someone's, you know, in a coma, whether their brain is active or not. You can measure it per second and check and see, are we getting enough waves here per second to classify as, you know, normal brain activity or even subnormal, but enough to live? Um, and that's how they do that. Okay, so I do expect you to know, you don't have to memorize what they look like, but you do need to know these waves and when you would normally see them, okay? <laughs> So delta waves would be my deep sleep in adults or normal in infants. Theta waves are normal in children or um, emotional stress in adults. Beta waves are my active mental activity or some type of sensory input. And then alpha waves are your average every day. I'm awake um, or resting with my eyes closed, but I'm not in deep sleep. Or even light phases of sleep would have alpha waves. Okay. All right, um, this is your summary of the cerebrum. Cranial nerves, y'all ready to do it? Okay, before we begin this, we're gonna go through all the cranial nerves, okay? I don't want you to stress out, please. We're gonna talk about some important ones briefly. We're not gonna dwell on them very long. The most important thing is to be able to tie the cranial nerve what it innervates, what does it do, okay? So the first one is the olfactory nerve. The olfactory nerve is cranial nerve one. Our cranial nerves are denoted by Roman numerals, which I'm not very good at, so don't make fun of me if I get them wrong. Cranial nerve one is the olfactory nerve. What does it do? It gives us or transmits sensations of our sense of smell, and it is a purely sensory nerve, okay? I think you guys already know about the olfactory bulb. Maybe not. We can talk about it a little bit if you want. Um, over here in this picture, you have your olfactory bulb up here up top. This bone right here is that cribriform plate. Coincidentally, that's the stuff that we had to remove from our brains if you had some bone right over the olfactory nerve. Um, so um, right here, that's the olfactory tract going to the brain. Um, there's that cribriform plate, and over here are your receptors in blue. Those are the ones that are picking up the chemicals in what you smell. So this would be like what you're smelling here, okay? What you're smelling on that side, that's the skin right there of the inside of your nose, and it's going to uh, relay or be picked up by those receptors, relay um, through that cribriform onto other neurons in your olfactory bulb, and then your olfactory tract takes it into your olfactory center in the cerebral cortex to be interpreted and associated, okay? 
Most important thing is to remember that it is the nerve for the sense of smell. That's your olfactory nerve. Are we ready for the next one? Okay, the optic nerve. We all know what this one does, right? Optic nerve is cranial nerve two. It is the nerve of vision, also a sensory nerve. We're not going to talk about it too much because we're going to do um, vision and all that later on in, the, in special senses. So we're not even going to worry about it too much. Same as olfactory, we'll do that in special senses too. Any questions on the optic nerve? No? All right. Oculomotor nerve. Y'all remember this from lab, right? Because you can be testing on it this week. That is cranial nerve three. Oculomotor. Oculo is eye, motor is move. Okay, the oculomotor nerve will control the muscles that uh, give us eye movement and also constrict the pupils. It is a motor nerve, purely motor. Oh, this picture does show you something else cool, though. Notice that you have the oculomotor nerve here controlling the muscles, right? You've got the trochlear nerve. It's going to have one of those muscles, and the abducens nerve will also have one of those muscles. So all three of these, abducens, trochlear, and oculomotor, will control the eye movement. The most important one is the oculomotor, okay? All right. Trochlear, number four. Trochlear nerve is also a motor nerve. And again, I told you it had one muscle. It's right here. One muscle, it's a superior oblique. We don't need to worry about it too much. Okay, moving on. Trigeminal. Ooh, tri, tri means three. Okay, this is cranial nerve five. This one's important. Why? Well, it's the largest the largest cranial nerve. Wow. That's huge. The trigeminal, not transgender, trigeminal, tri for three, has three branches. Ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular. Ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular. All those should be words we've all um, have not blocked out from AMP1, right? Good deal. So the trigeminal nerve is a huge nerve. It does have three branches. It's going to transmit just about all of the sensations, like touch, pain, and temperature from our face. How does it do that? Look at this ophthalmic branch over here. It covers your forehead and around your eye. Maxillary branch right here. It's going to cover the middle of your face. And then, where's my left branch? Oh, mandibular branch right here. Look, so it's going to go to the sensations of your jaw and around your ear. So this one trigeminal nerve covers all of the sensations on your face, right? That's huge. In addition to that, it's also this, tri um, this mandibular region of uh, branch is also gonna control the muscles that we use to chew. We call those the muscles of mastication, okay? All that with one cranial nerve. So now I've seen sensory and motor, so obviously it's going to be a mixed nerve, right? Because I have sensory here with temperature, pain, everything on your face, and motor to the muscles of mastication, so it's a mixed nerve. It is the largest cranial nerve, and I'm, I mean, you can bet your entire paycheck that you're going to hear about this one again, right? This is showing up for sure. Okay. Um, a little note over here, there is something called trigeminal neural neuralgia. I'm sure maybe you've heard of it before, where somebody, you know, gets a toothache and then three days later wakes up with their whole face hurting like crazy, right? Yeah? Okay. That does happen. So um, the trigeminal nerve, if it does become inflamed or irritated, it is likely to cause that pain. Um, throughout the whole area that it innervates. So it can cause some super painful stuff. Um, you also hear about it with shingles. A lot of times, you guys know what shingles is, right? So chicken pox is a virus. It's actually a herpes virus. Um, when you get chicken pox as a child, 
um, that virus can reside inside of your nerves and just lay dormant for years. I mean, it could be 30, 40 years before it pops up again. And then um, at any point in time that you, your immunity is lowered, it's liable to become active again. And if it comes back as an adult, <clears throat> it'll come back as shingles. And it comes back in that one nerve and it only hits that one spot that that nerve innervates. So sometimes you see this happen with the trigeminal, yeah, with the trigeminal nerve, and then you end up with a face full of super painful um, lesions from shingles. Yeah, this is why your parents vaccinated you against chicken pox. This is why you should get a booster, because it ain't fun. It ain't fun. And then you have people like me who, I don't know if I've ever had chicken pox. I asked my parents, they have no clue. This is the kind of childhood I had. I'm like, how do you not know? How do you not know if I've ever had chicken pox or I've been vaccinated? They're like, why are you worried about it? We don't know. And then I'm like, but I see there's like a scar here. Could that be chicken pox? And they're like, no, no we don't think you've ever had it. Okay. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea. I have no memories whatsoever, so I don't help myself either. Who knows? Anyways, that's trigeminal neuralgia. It does happen. It's not pleasant. Um, needless to say, trigeminal nerve is a big one. It is important to make sure you know it well. Any questions on trigeminal nerve? Yes. The what? It does one of the muscles for eye movement. All right, abducens, the abducens nerve. Y'all remember this one from lab? This is nerve number six. Um, and it does one, again, muscle here, the lateral rectus muscle for eye movement, and it is a motor nerve. No biggie. All right, facial nerve. Facial nerve, oh, I like this one, five, six, seven. Facial nerve, yes, important. Okay, why is it important? Because again, it has sensory from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, motor to muscles of facial expression. Okay. Yeah. And it also has some uh, of the autonomic nervous system in that, in that it sends parasympathetic fibers to the submandibular, sublingual, and lacrimal gland. That is your tears and saliva. Tears and saliva. I'm just kind of adding this because it's going to help you in the next unit. So obviously it's a mixed nerve. I have sensory and motor to the muscles of facial expression. Um, I don't know why I didn't add it, but I'm going to add it now. So there is something called Bell's palsy. Um, what is Bell's palsy? So just like the trigeminal nerve with the trigeminal neuralgia, the facial nerve can also become inflamed or irritated. And when it does, we call that Bell's palsy. You end up with a very uh, painful face. Um, if it's cut for any reason, the facial nerve, you may end up with paralysis, be able to like smile only on one side of your face. Or let's say you go to the dentist and you get that shot, right? When they give you that shot, it does normally numb the facial nerve, and that's why you can't move any of the muscles here. Can't do anything. You're talking like this, and you feel like your lips are this big. Okay, nobody cares. Okay. Anyways, you want to know about Bell's palsy because this happens a lot to us older individuals, right? And it's very easy to irritate that facial nerve. It's so superficial. So, like, if we go, you know, take a hot shower and then go get in the car and leave the window down, that cold air will actually irritate the nerve, and then we wake up the next day in severe pain or unable to move our face. That is Bell's palsy. Yes, yes. Question? Yes, it does, thank you. It does come out of nowhere, for real. Yeah, and it's scary. If you've never heard of it or never had it, it, it is very scary to just wake up or, you know, exactly, all of a sudden you can't do anything. That's why it's one of those things that I like to mention just for your knowledge, because I feel like this is stuff you guys would want to know. Any question on the facial nerve? So facial nerve is facial expressions. Trigeminal nerve is sensations, mastication, right? Making sure. 
vestibular cochlear nerve. We don't, I mean, we've already kind of talked about this when we did this special senses in lab. This is number eight, cranial nerve eight, vestibular cochlear. Obviously, you already know that it has, it comes from two branches, right? The vestibular branch, cochlear branch join each other to become the vestibular cochlear nerve. What does it do? Hearing and equilibrium. And it is a pure sensory nerve. So whenever you see vestibular cochlear, a little light should go off. Oh yeah, that's right. We had the cochlear branch from the cochlea. We had the vestibular branch from the semicircular canals. The two made vestibular cochlear. What did the cochlea do? It was hearing. What was the semicircular canals? Equilibrium. Have we done? We've done special senses, right? Thank you. <laughs> equilibrium. So hearing and equilibrium, vestibular cochlear nerve. I don't make you memorize the numbers, by the way. Glossopharyngeal, this is number nine. So this one, again, is another mixed one. We've got sensory from the posterior one-third, and we have motor to the pharynx and the parotid gland. Where did the sensory from the anterior one-third of the tongue come from? Ooh, ew. Y'all better flip through your notes. I have a box. What? Was it facial? Oop. Hold on. I'm lost. Yeah. Okay. There we go. We were on this one, right? Lost of pharyngeal? Okay. So we got sensory from the posterior of the tongue. And it is a, mo a, a mixed nerve. It's got both motor and sensory. What? And motor. It's a mixed. Don't worry. I'll make sure you know the ones you need to know. Oh, okay. Here we go. Vegas. Sorry. It's not you. It's me. Do you want me to slow down? Oh, it's, oh, honey, we're done. We're, we're taking the test. Vegas, Vegas nerve, Vegas nerve, Ooh, Vegas is a star. Okay, so Vegas nerve. Look at this one. It gives you sensory, motor, and autonomic, so it's a mixed nerve, okay? Look at the range of the vagus nerve starting from the head all the way down. That's how important this sucker is, okay? It's a big one, it's very important. And we're gonna talk about the vagus over and over and over when we start doing the autonomic nervous system, okay? So the vagus nerve is going to give me sensations of taste, touch, and stretching of our internal organs. It's gonna give me motor to the pharynx, the larynx, the soft palate, vocalization. It's gonna give me autonomic, it plays a huge role in autonomic to the SA node, AV node, those are in the heart, your glands, your smooth muscle in your uh, respiratory and your digestive system. That's a lot, yeah. So the vagus nerve is going to be that nerve that helps you chew things, not chew things up, but helps you swallow things. It's also gonna be that same nerve that decides how much or how fast your stomach is churning, how fast your intestines are pushing things out. It's pretty much the nerve of this entire uh, GI tract. And SA node, AV node, that means it has the ability to speed my heart up or slow my heart down. It has the ability to um, increase my rate of respiration or decrease my rate of respiration. So the vagus nerve is super cool, super cool because it covers all of these things. Um, and it's sensory, motor, and a huge role in autonomic. And if you look at this stuff, vagus nerve is that nerve that I told you guys, um, if you stimulate it the right way, you can cause a person to collapse, right? Yes. Like, I think we talked about it with, in some labs. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help it. I think we talked about it. He's like, don't go there. Don't do that again. We talked about it in some labs about ear washing, right? Yes? Okay, and so when you do an ear washer, you're like pushing water into someone's ear canal. 
it's supposed to be done with warm water. If you um, do it with cold water, that will irritate the vagus nerve. If you stimulate the vagus nerve, there's something called a vasovagal attack, which we'll talk about when we do the autonomic nervous system. But that vasovagal attack can actually cause a person to faint. To what? Yeah, it will cause a person to pass out. So there are different areas. And a lot of you, if you've done like martial arts and stuff, I'm sure, has anyone ever done martial arts? They will teach you how to stimulate the vagus nerve to, to make a person pass out. Yeah, I know, it's super cool. <laughs> Maybe one day <laughs> we'll do that in here. But yeah, because look what happens. I mean, you're talking about a nerve that controls your heart rate and your breathing rate, right? So if you can stimulate it enough to slow those down or to slow your breathing rate down, that oxygen's going to drop, you're going to collapse. So it's a pretty cool nerve. Getting what? Yeah, there's a lot of ways to do it. <laughs> yeah, it's a super cool nerve, but it is huge, and please make sure that you do know about the vagus nerve. Understand that it is sensory um, for the stretching of your internal organs, also motor to your pharynx or soft palate. It helps you swallow. You should, that's what you should know. Let's just do this. Okay, sensory to your internal organs, okay? Motor for swallowing and vocalization, and then autonomic, SA node, AV node, you can just say heart, um, respiratory, and digestive systems, okay? Made that a mess. Please be able to recognize the vagus. All right, the accessory nerve, this is number 11. We're almost to the end. It is a purely motor nerve, and it supplies the sternocleidomastoid. That was that one in the neck right there. Helps with your movement of your head. Yep. And then hypoglossal. This is number 12. This is the one that's going to move our tongue, aid in speech and swallowing. Again, a purely motor nerve. So you should be able to associate hypoglossal with your tongue movement. Okay. There is a chart here that summarizes all of those cranial nerves and what they do. Um, for the test, I will ask you about cranial nerves, not all of them, but I will ask you about the major ones. And really, you just need to be able to match up the nerve with what it innervates, okay? Um, so like you have to be able to say olfactory is going to be smell, uh, optic, vision, oculomotor, eye movement, um, trochlear, and Trigeminal, you should be able to say touch, pain, thermal sensations from the face. Um, and then abducens and facial, you should be able to say taste from the anterior two thirds, touch, pain, and sensations from uh, in the external ear canal. Muscles, oh, here it is, muscles of facial expression, right there. Be able to tie it with that. Vestibular cochlear and eh. although you should know that vestibular cochlear carrying an equilibrium. Okay. Uh, glossopharyngeal taste. And notice, I want you to notice that glossopharyngeal is the one that helps in swallowing, not mastication, not chewing. Okay, that's just swallowing. Okay, Vegas. Y'all better know it. Just know it all. Just know it all. Um, <laughs> I mean, look, blood pressure, oxygen, carbon dioxide levels, touch, pain, thermal sensations from your skin, um, sensations from your abdominal organs and your thorax. Um, I mean, what does it not do, right? Okay, y'all better know it too. Accessory, eh, and hypoglossal, eh. Maybe just hypoglossal with speech um, and swallowing. Okay? Y'all got this? Yes. So obviously the most important ones are going to be the largest ones, like the trigeminal, the facial, the vagus, those are essential. Start there. Start with those. And then you can look at the others. Okay? But seriously, trigeminal, vagus, facial. And then I would add 
some of the special ones like optic um, olfactory. Okay, I won't really ask you about the smaller ones because they're not that big of a deal. And then this is a mnemonic. Um, I just left it in here because sometimes people ask, well, how do you remember them in order? How do you do it? This is not how I remembered them. I can't share with you how I remember them, but you, um, I can share this one with you and you guys can look at it and see if that's how you want to do it. If you want to make up your own, that's fine too. Um, and it's really funny because not only did I learn it, I had to have them memorized, obviously, but I had my had a different mnemonic to do it. And it seems like every person that I, every colleague or um, <laughs> every physician I talked to or anybody that I went to school with or didn't even go to school with me and I asked them, well, how do you remember them? They're all obscene and can't be shared. So I'm sorry. <laughs> Nobody has come up with a normal mnemonic. And so here's one for you, good luck. If you want to learn them in order, you can use that. Okay? Cool? Yeah. Well, and then I think about it, like my notes from college probably need to be stored in a vault or burned. They cannot be shared with anybody because there's stuff in there that should never be seen by anyone. Um, <laughs> hey, you do what works for you, right? And that's why when you're taking your notes, you should take them just for you and in a way that you'll remember the stuff. It doesn't have to make sense to anybody else. It doesn't even have to be like, um, you know, rated PG. It can be whatever you want, whatever works for your mind. Um, so yeah, my notes are unshareable. Anyways, this is it. So it goes O, 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 to touch and feel very green vegetables O. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I do, <laughs> one of my best friends is a nurse anesthetist, and then I can never say it, and she's a nurse that puts people to sleep, okay, anesthetist, anesthetist. okay, so uh, we were driving back from Dothan on Sunday, and I think I was working on the PowerPoints, and she was like, oh, I remember the mnemonic I used. Are you giving it to them? And I was like, well, this is what was in the book. And I read it to her and she was like, oh yeah, no, that's not what I used. And, then, <laughs> and I asked her, well, what did you use? Hers wasn't too bad. It was something like O, 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 to touch and feel. It was not very, there was a different word here and there was a different word there and there. Um, so you can make up your own from that. All right. That's how people remember them in order. Anyways, that's enough about the cranial nerves. Hope everyone's awake. Let's talk about aging and the nervous system. This is gonna be quick. You can already pretty much predict what's gonna happen because when you age, what happens? Everything goes downhill, right? Yes, I'm a perfect example of that. Every day it goes down. It gets droopier, it sags. Yeah, <laughs> everything goes down. You're losing neurons. You have a diminished capacity for sending nerve impulses. So even the neurons that are there don't aren't as active as they used to be when you were younger. So those impulses are taking longer to get there if they get there at all. It takes longer to process information. <laughs> it does. Huh? What? Okay. Um, decreased conduction velocity, that is that action potential will actually be a little lower peak. Um, slow voluntary motor movement, uh, increased reflex time. It just all goes down. And then everything starts to degenerate. Things like your vision, your hearing, your sight, your taste, your smell, your touch, your balance, all that goes down because those neurons are decreasing in number and they are decreasing in activity. Okay, so that's what happens when you age. Not fun, I promise you, not fun. But the good thing is the more active you are, the more you can slow this down, okay? So remember, keep your brains working and they will last you longer. All right, a few of the disorders here, I put them on because I thought you may want to know about them. They're kind of cool. Um, over here, we have a uh, cerebrovascular accident or a transient ischemic attack. A cerebrovascular accident is a stroke. That is where you have a clot that comes in, completely occludes one of the capillaries in the brain, and then cuts off the blood supply and oxygen to that part of the brain, okay? That's a stroke. There is something called a transient ischemic attack or a TIA. 
Some of people call it a mini stroke. It's not really a stroke. That's where you have a blood vessel that, or a capillary that contracts. So it minimizes that blood flow, may stop it temporarily, but then it opens back up again. That is a TIA. Strokes happen more um, with high risk patients, ones that have high blood pressure, ones that have um, any reason to have any type of clots, like maybe they don't move as much, maybe they're in bed all the time, or they sit down a lot, or they're overweight, or they're diabetic. There's lots of things that make you high risk for having clots. A TIA can happen in someone as young as you, who is healthy, who doesn't have any risk factors for, um, for stroke or clotting, okay? And TIAs are, um, they're transient, meaning they're temporary. It's, it's a little bit of a, a constriction, and then that blood vessel eventually opens up again and everything goes back to normal. Um, if the TIA causes any damage or stays long enough, that's when it becomes classified um, or turns into a stroke, okay? All right. Um, then we have multiple sclerosis. People call that MS. I got to tell you, I've never liked abbreviating things because it just confuses me like crazy. <laughs> just saying. Okay, so MS is multiple sclerosis. What happens with multiple scler sclerosis? We have found now or beginning to believe that it's an autoimmune disease in which your own body creates antibodies that destroy myelin. So um, that myel those antibodies come out of your, your plasma cells that are creating them. They will go and attack the myelin sheath of your neurons, eat it away, um, thereby destroying that neuron and eventually being replaced by scar tissue. It is a progressive disease. We have reached the point where um, we can slow it down quite a bit. Um, but normally somebody with MS may be perfectly normal and then have a flare-up where all of a sudden their blood is flooded with antibodies and then they start to show symptoms and they may find treatment and reside the flare up or they may not. <laughs> like, no, not today. Okay, so that's multiple sclerosis. Hold on, get my mask on, I'm in trouble. So that's multiple sclerosis, MS. Any questions on MS? That's such a baby. <laughs> All right, Parkinson's disease. Some of you asked about, I can't talk like this. Some of you asked about this earlier, Parkinson's, what is it, what does it do? Or we talked about ataxia, and we're like, is that the same as tremors? And I said, no, it's not the same. Parkinson's is when you have that older individual that tends to have a, a tremor or shaking in their hands most of the time, right? So it is loss of motor, motor control due to degeneration of the neurons that release dopamine, and those neurons are actually found in the substantia nigra. We had talked about it earlier. Don't worry about it too much. The idea is that um, that loss of dopamine is what causes the loss of motor control. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that sort of dopes everybody down, right? It's a calming one. Keeps everything nice and smooth. When you are low on dopamine or you lose those dopamine-releasing neurons, you end up with overexcitability, so you get tremors, okay? And I really do think that they actually named dope. I guess they don't call it dope anymore. They named it in the 80s. We used to call it dope, and dope was like a replacement for dopamine. Okay, maybe not. Anyways, they treat it with L-dopa. I know, right? They treat it with a drug called L-dopa, which is an artificial... Um, by the way, L-dopa is an artificial dopamine. And then we have Alzheimer's disease. This is my disease. I know, right? <laughs> Alzheimer. Oh, by the way, this, um, I didn't put a year here. Parkinson's disease can start showing up as early as 55 years. So like 55 to 65 is when you start to see that. And this can actually show up somewhere in your 30s. This is just for your knowledge. You're looking at 35 to 55-year-olds. Um, so Alzheimer's is the one that starts with a little bit of memory loss, and then you end up eventually with a patient um, who can't remember who you are, can't remember who their family members are, um, can't remember much of anything. So it is progressive memory loss, um, and it is due to plaques of amyloid. Amyloid is sort of like a buttery substance that will deposit itself into neurons, causing them to be ineffective, and they no longer can transmit an impulse. So that is Alzheimer's disease. So 
okay? Cool. Um, I already told you guys what the bonus is, but I do want you to know, I want you to know these. I do want you to know them because I think they're important. And I just want you to know like something about them, like, um, you know, be able to recognize that Alzheimer's disease is progressive uh, memory loss because of plaques of amyloid. You know that Parkinson's is motor control loss because you're losing dopamine or you have a deficiency of dopamine. Multiple sclerosis is autoimmune, destroys the myelin sheath. And then um, stroke or TIA, just understand that a stroke or TIA means that you have cut off the blood supply to that part of the brain. Okay, is that too much? Nope. You guys got it. 